Hello, Boo Crew, and welcome back to this couch where I tend to talk about really deep stuff. First, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody when it came to Adam's video. I really didn't expect that many people to watch it. Um, it really led us to some great places. We ended up in Utah, and Adam got a lot of help. Did he get COVID? Yes, but we're out of those woods now, so there'll be an update video on all of that very soon. Today is a weird story. Obviously, you're seeing the title of this video, and you're thinking, what are you talking about? I find it so weird that people don't ask me about my TikTok username a lot because as we know, it's Selena Spooky Boo and I really don't produce spooky content unless you're like a really true deep fan who's seen the podcast and stuff like that. You're probably wondering, yeah, I never really thought of that. So let's rewind to like 2000 and you know what? Let's rewind to the actual beginning. I'm not going to make this story like huge and long, but I might as well give you a little bit of background on who I am and the things that I used to do. Selena Spooky Boo was actually born quite a few years ago. I'm talking like circa 2015, I decided to start a podcast and that was The Haunted Estate. And I'm not going deep into the podcast, but I'll give you a little reason on why. I have spent the most part of my life haunted. Hmm. <laughs> When I say haunted, I grew up seeing a lot of things that people didn't see, hearing a lot of things, being parts of things, and I actually ran into a bit of an issue. The only way that I can really explain it in a way that people can understand, you know, in the Conjuring movies when Lorraine keeps seeing like the nun and that's like the demon that keeps showing up type of thing. I had one of those situations. Actually, the first time I ever told the public about that was in that first Sam and Colby video that I was in. And by the way, coolest dudes in the world. And I just feel like they really saw me for who I was and made me a little bit more confident to tell you guys exactly who I am and what's happened in my life. The exorcism was not on me, but I was a part of it because I was a part of a team. When I hit my late teens, I'd spent so much of my life dealing with ghosts. And I'll give you like a tiny bit of a story. Like I'd be at a party and a voice would come into my head and I'd be like, okay, I know this is definitely a spirit. Be like, this is my granddaughter over here. Please tell her this kind of thing. And I do not claim myself to be psychic. Yes, sometimes I hear things and I see things, but I don't get to choose them. I don't get to see them like, you know, there's psychics out there and they're like, yes, there's four spirits in the room and this is happening. That's not what I have. I called myself the home reader. And my first book that I ever wrote was kind of an accompaniment of the podcast. And it's called The Home Reader. Because for me, when I go into haunted locations, I can do this very strange thing. So I have cue cards or I have a friend who I give my cue cards to. And I walk around and I'll stand in a spot and I kind of do this weird dissociation. And I start seeing through my literal eyes and kind of my mind's eye a different point in time. So I will see memories and I'll smell smells that could have happened and I'll see people and things kind of like a residual haunting. A residual haunting is, you know, something that's repeating itself over and over and over again. So say every morning at 3 a.m. you hear boots go down the hallway. That's a residual haunting. It's not an intelligent haunting. It's almost like a video of a memory in time that's going to just keep rolling over and over and over again. But for me, I see like the residual memories and things that happened in places, along with sometimes hearing and seeing things. So when I first went into college, I was in police foundations. A lot of people don't know this, but there was this paranormal kind of study group um, in the town. I don't really want to disclose what it was all affiliated with because I don't know if they're not together currently now. And there's a long story there. I had a lot of tests done on myself and it was very interesting, like tests where they would show three cards and then the person would go behind and they'd choose a card and I would have to tell them the card that they chose. So it was a heart, a star, and a letter H. I know that's very weird. I don't know why they chose that. So the person would go behind. We did it 20 times and 19 times I got it right. 
which blew my mind because to me, I spent so much of my life trying to validate these feelings and you know how weird it is to go up to somebody at a party and be like, um, I know you're totally hammered, but your grandmother wanted me to let you know that that pink robe that you, that you wanted is in the closet in the orange bedroom. Like things were so specific. So while I was in college here, I kind of linked up with a group. Um, I wouldn't say a group. It was a pastor and, um, an exorcist. Um, he came later into play. His name was Costell. He's from Michigan. Um, he is still alive. Unfortunately, the pastor I did work with had passed away. It was weird. Before I was coming downstairs to tell this story, Adam was like, are you sure that you want to like put this story out there? And I was like, it's in my book. I told it on my podcast. Why not tell? He's like, yeah, but then like everybody's going to see. Everybody's going to know about it. But the thing is, my thing with you is that I'm 100% genuine about who I am. And why doesn't anyone wonder why I'm spooky, boo? Because my whole life has been so spooky. There is a very serious side to me. Um, a side that you guys don't see. And when it comes to the paranormal... <sighs> The paranormal world changes the way that you see life, changes the way that you see death and the way that you believe in good and evil. When I started working with Costell and Pastor John, everything I'd ever wondered about myself and I put forward was validated. We worked on cases that were blown away. People would reach out, you know, to these like figures of God and stuff. Be like, I don't know what to do. I think my kids possess. And I didn't know what I believe. Of course, I'd seen the movie The Exorcist. But did I believe that like these crazy, unbelievable things could happen? Not really. I was like, this is movie magic. And I'm going to tell you, most of the time it is movie magic. But things do happen. We have been on a lot of cases. But the first one, the first one was the big one. I was asleep one night and I had received a call and it was like, I want to say like 445 and it was his pastor and he said, Hey, I linked up with this group. They told me about you. I've been through all your files. I really would like your help because for me, when I go into a place, interesting story, buying a house for us was very difficult. Because I would go into these houses and I would feel the energy that had been there, the dark and the light and the things that had possibly happened in these rooms and these memories and why the house was being sold. And it was just, we probably, yeah, we went through like 40 to 70. I know it's a big difference, but this was a long time ago. We went through a lot of houses till we found this house. And the energy here was very nice. But if I walked into a place and there was a really bad thing, The darkest I think I'd ever seen was like a gray and it's like a cloud that hovers at the ceiling. But again, it's not like I just walk into anywhere and it's there. Like I need to go into this weird state where I kind of disassociate and then I can see it. I get this call. I'm kind of like, what is going on? I end up calling the group and they're like, yes, verified. Like this is a thing. There's a bit of an emergency going on. Okay, this is wild. So I'm going to name these girls different names. Let's call them Abby and Jennifer. So Abby and Jennifer had inherited their grandmother's house after she passed away. They were living with her going to university in Toronto. And she passed away about a year into their education. They did what any, you know, 19, 20 year old girls were going to do and they started to party and they started to have fun and they get super drunk and they'd hook up with boys and the house really kind of fell apart when it was really like the grandmother's pride and joy. Um, she had left it to her granddaughters, which created a lot of an aminosity, aminosity, is that word? <laughs> with their mother. <clears throat> she had a lot of gambling debt. It wasn't a great situation. They were pissed off that, you know, they lost their grandmother, this this mother figure that was always more of a mother that, to them than their mother. And they wrecked this house. They were partying. They had, they had boys over. They had had a really crazy time. But one night, a really bad thing happened. They were at a local bar when they had met two men, dudes, guys, and they were from far away. That's what I said. I don't know where they were from. They just said, you know, 
They had accents. They were from far away. I'm like, okay, cool. That night, the two sisters were with them in the kitchen. Jennifer decided to go to bed. Abby stayed. In the morning, Jennifer came downstairs and they were gone. Abby was on the floor and some very bad things had happened to her. Weirdly, she just brushed it off, didn't want to talk about it, kind of like tried to go on with her life, but it was very clear that something was very wrong with Abby. When it comes to the paranormal and all those kinds of things, it's such a delicate balance with mental health because so many mental disorders and stuff like that are influenced or I don't know the right way to say this without getting in trouble but you know a lot of eccentric people will claim ghosts and claim demons and stuff and that's why I don't talk about it publicly because I have a hard time when someone says that is absolutely not real and I've seen it And believe me, I don't want it to be real either. I was living a great life knowing that these kinds of things didn't exist and only lived in movies. But a very bad thing had happened. And very quickly, Abby started to change. She stopped showering and she stopped going to class. The girls had this big conversation that they were done with that life. And they wanted to go back to being like their grandma's girls and going to school and getting good grades and taking care of her house. So they cleaned up that whole house that weekend after the bad thing had happened. But something was wrong with Abby. The way they explained this one night really gives me shivers to my core at this time. They were going to watch a movie and it was a couple days after they were cleaning and Abby was taking a garbage bag through the kitchen and off the kitchen was a big bay window that overlooked a garden. It was a circular garden and their grandmother loved this garden. It was full of flowers and all these like heirloom bushes that had been around forever, forever. Abby's in the kitchen and Jennifer's on the couch and she can see her. She walks into the kitchen with the garbage bag. She stops, dead stops, stares out the bay window Jennifer can see her like from this side, staring out the bay window. She's like, Abby, Abby. She's not snapping out of it. She literally has to go to her sister and like shake her. And she like drops the garbage. It's nighttime. Just looks black out the bay window. She just drops the garbage. They end up going to bed. I don't know. I don't know if they watched a movie or went to bed. That morning, Jennifer goes downstairs. Her sister's not awake. She goes into the kitchen. She puts tea on. I don't know what she's doing. I'm trying to give you guys the image but she looks at that window that bay window where her sister was staring it is as if somebody had taken a lawnmower and wood chipper to the entire backyard things have been growing up the fences for decades and everything was just on the ground as if it had been obliterated and blown up she grabs her sister brings her downstairs they run outside as they're walking they hear these weird crunches As they start lifting up debris, there are literal dead birds all over the ground. When they clean up, I don't remember the exact number, but it was like a spooky number. I don't know if it was like 13 or 30. I couldn't even find my book to reference. But there was just these birds and they were dead, but there was no reason they weren't injured. It was like something in that yard had just blown up in the middle of the night without any sound. And it was such a weird coincidence that Abby had gone into this like weird state and just like stared out at what was happening. I know other things happened. And in my book, I mentioned that literally they were sitting on the couch and everything in the cupboards just like came out and smashed, smash. And they had called their mom and their mom was just like whatever and wasn't helping them. But Abby got strange. And as I said, she stopped showering. She stopped going to school. But then things that couldn't be explained started happening. Like her room, I don't remember if it, I think it was hot. Her room, so say the house was 20 degrees. So that's like 70 degrees for Americans or something. So say it was 20 degrees. Her room was like 40. They could literally turn the heat off and her room would stay hot. They had reached out. Well, 
Jennifer had reached out to the pastor and he's the one who was like, I don't know. You know what? To be honest, I don't know if it was because I was a young woman or because he hadn't dealt with something so like this before. But he called me and I was literally there that day. And I remember going up and knocking on the door and Jennifer opened the door and Abby was behind her and she looked as if like she was a pale girl. She had blonde hair. But it was as if like her hair was like horsetail hair and it was really messy. And she was so white that she was like this bluey tinge, huge bags under her eyes. She smelled horrible. So sorry if you're watching this. It was a very strange feeling. And Jennifer, like I hadn't even talked to her yet. She gave this huge hug and I came in. And I hadn't even done my like disassociative thing to try and like connect to whatever was going on in that place. And the whole ceiling was already black. For me. I remember that night after meeting the pastor, we were sitting in the living room and he's like, I explained what I did and I was so uncomfortable because like I had done this with friends and like. I've done a bunch of cases on my own and with friends and stuff like that. But this was my first time feeling like, damn, this feels like a movie. But I sat on this couch and I tried to do like that thing where I disassociate and I see what's around me. And the second I did, everything was black. Everything was weird. Everything was wrong. And I remember kind of moving through the house and knowing there was like a good energy, but things were bad. And I remember when I did that, Abby ended up like passing out. Like there were so many weird things. So Costello ended up showing up and we were going to prep for the exorcism. It's so weird to talk about even now. Like I'm telling you, like this was quite a few years ago now. (sighs) It's weird to talk about because there's so many reasons why I pulled back from the paranormal world, but I feel so ready to jump back into it. And it's definitely a huge thanks to Sam and Colby. If if you go deep in my YouTube channel, like I used to go to haunted hotels and I do stuff. And I think it was really like inspired by a lot of those YouTubers who did that in the past. And I just like they gave me the opportunity to kind of do it again because like I said, I stopped because I got too close to something. Anyways, when it came to this exorcism, it was such a unique circumstance. We went up to her room, which I'm telling you right now was hot. We put her in a chair, which was weird, tied her ankles and her wrists down. She was fine. She didn't want to be how it was. She wanted to be better. It's like flashes in my mind. I'm not going to waste time telling you all the ins and outs, but the parts that freaked me out and showed me how real things can be. Costal was behind her and holding her shoulders down and he was like reading scripture and, and talking and casting out and stuff like that. And the room went from hot to cold so fast. And I remember just knowing it because I got goosebumps. And I was like, ooh, I'm spooked. But I wasn't. I was freezing. And having this shared experience with a bunch of people was bananas. And that's a weird word to use. But he was doing this. And what scared me the most was she started talking. But there was more than her voice. It was like three people were layered saying the same things at a fraction of a second slower than each other. And it really wasn't working. Like you could tell it was happening, but we were like three hours into it. We had taken breaks. We kept going for it. So it got to this point and she kind of like stopped breathing. was like doing these really weird faces. It was so strange. And her sister, Jennifer, got down in front of her, put her hands on her knees and we're just like, screaming in her face like you got this and this and blah blah like screaming in her face had moved away from the whole god aspect of 
of things it was just like no and ah, and i love you and this is not gonna happen this is not gonna take us out and i i love you and this is gonna happen and it was within a second everything felt different it was like It was like everything was building. Like It wasn't even like there was background noise. But it all stopped and everybody kind of backed up at once. And I think at this point it was literally like 4 o'clock in the morning. We literally took Abby, put her in bed. And Jennifer, me, Costell, and the pastor went downstairs. And she made us like tea and crumpets kind of thing. And we were all just talking about how insane that was. And we hoped it worked. A couple hours later, shower goes on. And we're like, oh my god, she's up. She comes downstairs. And I had not seen this girl. This girl, you know, was tan and pink lips and she was so beautiful. And she did not look like that girl I had met 12 hours, 20 hours earlier. They went on to have great lives. But it blew my mind. I did. I've been to a lot of cases. And the reason why I started the podcast. (laughs) A weird little paranormal group in my little ass town. I spent so much of my life doing this. So much of my life doing spooky ass stuff. Decided that they wanted to like spread all these stupid rumors. Believe me, I was a child here. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to create this podcast because I am so educated in this. And I know what I'm talking about and I've lived through all of it. And then I wrote the book. But the podcast started because I had to move away from the paranormal world. But I still want to be a part of it. Everything started when I was really little. I had these two friends, Adrian and Tessa. We used to play with these Ouija boards in her basement. And I have memories of the most insane things happening ever And one time we connected to something and we would talk to it every single day. And I started doing these weird things. I kept promising my unborn children all the time. Like I promised this, this, and this. We all did. None of us have children. I don't know their circumstances. But that thing that we talked to when I was a child came back and I think has been with me throughout my entire life. And that's why I don't play with Ouija boards. I love Ouija boards. I really do. But I don't play with them because I connected to it. I saw it when I was seven. I saw it when I was 13. And in low parts of my life, I've seen it. But I started working these cases where really dark things were happening and I kept seeing it. I don't know if I can talk about the big scary. I don't know if I'll ever be able to talk about that. But I haven't seen it in a very long time. I don't know if it's maturing or getting older or maybe there's enough time between us or maybe I'm just a stronger person. But I want to do more spooky stuff. And I don't really want to like go to hotels and stuff. I want to connect with people. Do a YouTube series. Did you hear that? Do a YouTube series where I literally go to people's houses and see if I can connect. Help people that are actually dealing with something that's affecting their daily lives. Anyways, this was spooky and weird. I kind of talked all over the place, but I'm going to be honest, I was nervous. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. If you like it, smash that like. Please don't forget to subscribe. Always tell me the kind of videos you want. I have lots of reaction videos coming up for you guys, and I hope that you love it. But Boo Crew, stay spooky. Stay you.